So can you hear me now, Dr. Hamouda? I'm going to start introducing you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you quality. quite well. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Good evening, all. Uh, this is me, Ali al uh, I'm glad to be with you tonight to introduce Dr. Hamouda Salhi. Dr. Hamouda Salhi is Professor of Translation Studies and Interpreting at the University of Tunis al Manar in Tunisia, where he teaches uh, postgraduate students uh, in the area of translation and interpreting. He will talk about meaning, so he will talk about semantics, more accurately, lexical semantics, but he will approach that area by adopting a pragmatic approach by giving the context for consideration. Dr. Hamouda, in addition to being a professor of translation studies and interpreting, he is a professional translator and a professional interpreter. So please join me to welcome Dr. Hamouda. Dr. Hamouda, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali al manna uh, And I think I can call you Ali because yeah, we are friends. Yeah, please. Thank you very much, uh, Ali. Uh, for a wonderful and stimulating series of talks, I uh, would also like to thank you dearly for uh, your huge effort in shedding uh, more light on Arab translation scholars from around the world. And uh, thanks are also due to you, dear ladies and gentlemen, for attending this talk either directly in the Zoom webinar or through the live uh, stream and live streaming. And I wish to invite you to share your knowledge and expertise in this subject matter. So the subject of, uh, of, of this talk, uh, this talk is uh, about an area of the crossroads of language, linguistics, pragmatics, translation, and interpreting. And I'm going to talk to you this, this evening, or this afternoon, depending on where you are now, uh, I'm going to talk about my love and passion for translation, for language, for interpreting, and translation being an area encompassing all other areas, including culture. So um, there is a picture, and I'm going to describe the picture in, 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 in the screen I wanted to share, a PowerPoint presentation, where you find words in English that are linked to other words and uh, in, in red and other words linked to other words in blue and uh, and and words who which are not related to each other so the i wanted to 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 invite you to comment on on, on that picture on the relationships that are uh, going on over there uh, and, and the question I wanted to ask more particularly is whether the relationship is a relationship between words or a relationship between meanings. And here I would like to come to the conclusion that in fact it is any match between two words, any match, any relatedness, any relationship is a relationship between meanings and not words. This means that words are just vehicles for meaning. But active career of careers of meaning. What does this mean? You have the context and you have the word. And some people, especially in the pragmatics community, they say it is the, the context that decides about the meaning of words. But this is only partially true. Why? Because there is also power and there is a, a meaning load that the word is coming with when it is 
arranged in a particular context, in a particular utterance. It has its own force, its, its own load. Some people might argue that this is a semantic role, but here we are going to speak about meaning. And me meaning is not only described and outlined in the area of semantics, but also in the area of pragmatics, means language in use. So, the, 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 the word of communication and, and translation is not binary. And I have a picture showing a, uh, a crossing. And there is turn right and turn left. When turn right is ambiguity and turn left is precision. As if the world of language, of communication, is described as a binary world. But this is not the case. It is not possible to describe a, an utterance, I would say, either ambiguous or precise. Even sometimes it is ridiculous to engage into that debate in the first place. So, either precise or ambiguous statements, this is what, what we find in the literature. But there are always limits to precision. Not only that, ambiguity can be made to serve precision. So, sometimes when we are ambiguous, we are uh, moving closer to precision. Take the example of political discourse. Political discourse, some politicians, some prominent politicians, I would say, such as the former French president, François Mitterrand. He stated once in a speech, in a very famous speech, he said, Ma constitution est robuste, l'autre est à revoir. So here the ambiguity of the word constitution, and constitution in French means two things, displays two meanings, the bodily constitution of the person, here in this case it is, the, it is pre President Mitterrand, and the constitution which is the, uh, the, the, the law in the land, the supreme law. So he wanted to keep this ambiguous and to allow the audience or the reader or the readership to interpret this utterance the way they like, but there is a hidden meaning. And pragmatics deals with uh, those intentions. Am I heard quite well, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ali? Just to check. I think I am. I can see myself. So, hello? Dr. Ali, can you hear me? Now, yes. But before that, for one minute, no. Can you repeat, please? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, you're welcome. So, because I kept silent for a minute or so, so silence is, uh, is also a form of speech. Uh, so, um, digging ever deeper into this notion, we find that the roots of the seemingly clarity of speech are planted in the soil of ambiguity, in the soil of confusion, in the soil of multiplicity of meaning, and in the soil or the ground of uh, meaning complementarity, which is the subject of this talk. I would like to start by ask you, asking you a stupid question and an 
um, send out to you an awkward invitation. And here, uh, I'm going to state some lexical items or uh, sentences. Uh, and I invite you to try your hand at uh, these utterances. Think of possible interpretations into Arabic and English. Set number one, dove. What are the possible interpretations of this utterance? So it is a lexical item, a word, but it is an utterance. Trade, second. Three, community. Four, good. Resolution, soft, hard, bank, evidence, assai, al-umrah, ra'is. Set number two. Eight, their lunch. Second, al-malafat al-hassasa wal mushta'ila. And this is taken from a message sent from General Khalifa Haftar very recently to the European Commission. Third, Mary began the book. Fourth, Mary began the rock. And finally, bus, ferry and rail services were suspended due to COVID-19, for example. Now, with that invitation, I'm going to uh, present the structure of my talk. So in this talk, I'm going to take you into a journey, uh, starting somewhere in the introduction by setting the framework about relationships, I have already talked about that. Precision versus ambiguity, done already. And the stupid invitation, already sent out. And a problem in the classroom, classroom of translation. And then I'm going to tell you a personal story. I called it the story of community. And then state some assumptions. Then I'm going to um, uh, outline this new approach to translation, uh, which is the meaning complementarity approach that is motivated by uh, the computational linguistics and the lexical semantics uh, in particular, and more particularly motivated by the generative lexicon theory. And I'm going to talk about the mental lexicon, what is going on. Uh, in the mind of the translator, in the mind of the interpreter when doing his or her exercise. And then the uh, generative power of the lexical items, how lexical items are generating meanings. There is There are whole mechanics and whole machinery for uh, the items to generate novel meanings and how to accept them, and how to recognize them. Uh, and then meaning complementarity versus contrastivity, meaning contrastivity, and then mediation. And with mediation, I'm going to uh, give you examples, concrete examples from translated texts or translated or interpreted events uh, where you have to do some matching in the development of meaning. Each word is developing its own meaning, and then you will see where the matching takes place, where there is a hit. And in the mediation, I'm going to speak briefly about the uh, pragmatic, uh, let's say, mediation, and then we'll conclude my, my talk. So, so here, this is my, my, my structure. One day, I was going downstairs to the staff room, the teacher's room, after a translation class. One undergraduate student crossed my path. Perhaps it was the path of my life in a cramped corridor. Perhaps it is the translation corridor. It is narrow. 
but wide also. Whether it is narrow or wide, it has always been busy over history, this corridor. So the student asked me, Sir, how to translate the word community in Arabic? And without hesitation, I rushed to reply. Because I was rushing to the staff room for my break, I told her, Mujtama. When I went to the staff room, I found on the desk the, there a, a copy of a text. Perhaps a teacher forgot it over there. And all of a sudden, the word translation caught my eye. It was an exam. Uh, 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 a translation exam. So I started reading the text and came across the phrase the European community. And I said, wow! I felt embarrassed and genuinely remorseful about what I had done. So despite the fact that I was a junior a teacher, rushing away to answer, to provide an equivalent to a word without asking about the context. And here in Tunisia we say, uh, or even about the, the phrase in which that uh, word occurred, is really a, uh, a sinful crime and unforgivable offense to language and translation in general. So I should have asked about uh, the context to provide um, an accurate rendering such as al jamaa al Europea. So here, despite the fact that mujtama and jama'a, uh, they come from the same root, but they express different meanings. Al jama'a can be translated as group, as community, but al uh, mujtama uh, can be translated as society. So such incident taught me a very good lesson in my life, in my professional life, in my teaching life. And the lesson made me pretty suspicious and sometimes even too suspicious about meaning. I mean genuine meaning, not any meaning. So both in the source language text and in the target language text. So I turned into an extremely annoying character when I am asked about something to translate from one language to another because I started to ask too many questions about the context and always seem to make a simple conversation or a simple question to make it into a something like a police interrogation. So why that concern? I developed that concern about meaning. And I, at some point, I really was worried about the concern to be some, uh, some uh, a concern of psychological order. But later I found out that it is of a cognitive order or nature. Because some meanings displayed by the same lexical uh, item can be either contrastive or complementary. Contrastive means a word having two meanings. These two meanings cannot occur in the same context. They are exclusive, contrastive, accidental, exactly like coffee and tea in a coffee shop or in a cafe. You cannot order both. 
coffee and tea. So this is simply stated and described the contrastivity, meaning contrastivity. And on the contrary, we've, uh, on, on the opposite, I would say, we have meaning complementarity. And meaning complementarity is the norm rather than the exception. Each word, each lexical item is showing, displaying that complementarity. It is complementarity like coffee and sugar. When you go to a cafe, you can order coffee, but also you ask for sugar, but not too much sugar, especially during this COVID, the lockdown during the COVID-19. So my interest in linguistics was gradually shaped throughout my life by all the different ways in which I have experienced languages. Experienced languages as a learner, as a translator, as an interpreter, as a teacher, as a researcher, and more than that, as a person who is meditating and contemplating sorry, about language and communication and translation and, and, and so on and so forth. So, however, because I always try to record myself, my voice when interpreting, so I have uh, compiled a corpus of audio recordings of myself performing interpreting in the booth, basically. So the recording of my own interpreting outputs during conferences made me fully aware that language can, <coughs> can be a means of conveying much more than just our thoughts, than what we wanted to share. And authors, when they produce texts, or source language authors, I mean, or speakers in a conference, they are planting trees of words with the seeds, and the seeds are core meanings. Core meanings are ma'na and nawawi. The, the, the meaning or the sense, I would say, it is smaller in a uh, smaller unit than the meaning. The sense, the core meaning, that is omnipresent in any usage. So, before I move on to explain the approach of meaning complementarity in more detail, I wish to make the following assumptions. So here I'm using the term translation to mean interpreting as well. And meaning complementarity... Sorry. Yes, please. Can you hear me, Dr. Ali? Hello, hello? Can you hear me? Hello, Dr. Ali? Hello, hello? Yeah. So there are breaks. I cannot hear you quite well. Talk. I'm not sure whether the problem is at my end or at your end. But I hope that you can... Can you hear me clearly? Hello? Hello, hello, hello? Yes, we hear you. You can hear me. I think it's uh, Ali's problem then. Thank you. So I carry on and Ali perhaps will join us later. So this is the first, uh, the, 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 uh, first assumption, is that with the term translation, I mean also interpreting. And interpreting is the act of interpreting, a tarjam al fawriya And interpretation is a ta'wil, something else, which is in pragmatics, we have recourse to interpretation, a ta'wil, ta'wil al-kalam. Uh, 
So meaning complementarity is more of a pragmatic and less of, of a, a semantic approach to language, to translation. Despite the fact that it deals with words and lexical items, and here I would like to refer to the very famous book by Muna Baker, in other words, in, 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 in which she um, divided the, 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 the equivalence levels into two, at word level and above word level. So at word level, uh, we can also uh, think and uh, address equivalence, despite the fact that I am hesitant to use the word equivalence, I would like to use the word uh, interpretation instead. And the other thing is, uh, the, the third, um, hello? So the third assumption is that lexical items are not necessarily individual words. We can have a phrase, and this is still uh, a, a, a called a lexical item. I come now to the mental lexicon. Somewhere in the mind, there exists a whole mental lexicon. It is like the dictionary, a, a, a human word store, or the mental dictionary, I would say. So it is always informative to explore what is going on in the mind of the translator or the mind of the interpreter while he or she is performing his exercise or her exercise. In fact, research into the translation process has already attempted to analyze the psychological reactions of translators and interpreters as they translate, as they interpret, using methods such as the mental lexicon. The mental lexicon here somewhere stored, we have the input in the let, let me take the example of simultaneous interpreting, which can uh, explain the process more visibly. You have an input, source language, a speaker. You, uh, there is an act of comprehending it, trying to look for words and the possible meanings in usage. And then you process the meaning in conversion or transfer, but then looking into your mental lexicon and the mental lexicon of novice translators and novice interpreters or students of translation is very narrow that's why they don't have the flexibility that is sufficient to accommodate novel meanings that so many words so many lexical items are exhibiting and they tend to translate core meaning by core meaning, or prototypical meaning by prototypical meaning. I will give you an example. The, the, the um, adjective good, if I pronounce adjective good, the most prototypical equivalent into Arabic would be jayid or jayida. But I have studied and investigated this adjective and I found up to 16 equivalents in Arabic, jayida. When I say a good knife, a good knife is sakin on had. لأن جودة السكين في حدتها. A good driver, سائق ماهر في المهارة. It's another way of goodness, another form of goodness. Good highway, good highway without holes, <laughs> and 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 wide enough. A good, uh, a good Friday which is an idiomatic expression, uh, it is al al hazina So you cannot find in any dictionary good with equivalent in Arabic al hazin or al azima al al azima So this is the mental lexicon uh, uh, again. Questions pertaining to vocabulary size, word storage, word links, and meaning relationships, complementarity, uh, uh, and, and contrastivity, and word retrieval from the memory 
are of paramount importance to the work of uh, the translator and the interpreter. And retrieval is you retrieve what you need and then you produce uh, a, a target language text or a speech. One lexicographer has justifiably noticed that the world's largest database of examples, real life examples, in contexts is dwarfed by the collection we all carry uh, uh, around subconsciously in our in our heads. And here, because the 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 difference is a difference between static source and dynamic source. Dictionaries they are fossilized with examples and uh, they are limited, finite, but a human being, a human mind is still active and dynamic and the examples, they will be enriched with the experience of the person, with the experience of the interpreter, with the experience of the translator. So, it's, so it is very important to study the uh, lexical uh, semantics. Uh, well, some findings brought about by studies in uh, in the lexical, uh, in, in the mental lexicon, uh, indicate that humans activate many more words than one might require. This means that a given word is stored next to some other words, and far away from other words, exactly like a room full of books which are stored randomly from floor to roof. When one wants to pick up one book, like the books, which are very few behind me, uh, he will not get it unless he touches or gets out some other books. So the direct evidence comes from the way some of uh, two or more words in certain instances blend together in, in, into one. Like the example of, uh, let me, like the slips of the tongue. When I say it's cold in Greece land, I didn't mean Greece. I meant, it is a word blended from the words Greenland and Iceland. So, Greenland. This means that Greenland and Iceland are stored together next to each other. So, there is the generative power of lexical items. Uh, the uh, scholar James Postayovsky has developed a whole theory called the generative lexicon theory. And uh, Postayovsky's main argument. Uh, are that words are never passive careers of meaning, but rather active contributors to the overall meeting, uh, meaning uh, uh, of the phrase or the sentence, where they appear through the generative power they are endowed with. And um, he rejects the traditional view of enumerating, sense enumerative, it is called, when you enumerate them in a dictionary or a glossary or word meaning postulates. This word means this, 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 this uh, meaning, and that's all. Uh, again, I'm going to skip some of the uh, uh, details. So, meaning complementarity versus contrastivity. Uh, contrastivity, like when you say the bank of the river and the richest bank in the city. The first bank is the edge of the river. It, when, it, when it occurs in a, in a sentence or utterance, it excludes, ex excludes the other meaning of bank, which is a financial institution. So this is an example of contrastive meaning or contrastive meanings. Remember, tea and coffee, they cannot occur together. Now, when I say, uh, the a bank uh, increased its interest rate. And when I say the bank is next to the newly constructed store, when I say 
the bank fired half of its employees. So here, the three meanings of bank complement each other, in the sense that bank uh, can be a, uh, the building that houses the financial institutions institution, and can be the management firing half of its employees, and uh, the uh, accounting and the management, the financial management increased its financial uh, uh, increased its interest rate. So here, this is a very good example of uh, meaning complementarity uh, versus meaning contrastivity. So I will move on straight to mediation, which is the final part in my talk. Uh, mediation involves the act of negotiation and requires uh, the availability of many cho multiple choices. Mediation is simply the search of possible matching or matchings and or possible clashing between meanings and not between words and phrases. It means matching cross-linguistically, I mean, or cross, perhaps cross-culturally. I'll give you an example. In one, I would like to ask you a question first. Do you suggest the lexical item taqrir to be the equivalent of the lexical item in English effort? Obviously, most of you would say no, but this is the case. It can be when we study language in use, not the semantic uh, uh, aspect of it the enumerative, I would say, but language in use. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I say the executive committee or executive board uh, commended the uh, drafting committee for the great effort. Now, effort, if you translate it into Arabic, it would be something like وأشادت المجلس التنفيذي أو اللجنة التنفيذية بجهود اللجنة الصياغة. And you stop. This is not complete. In English, effort can mean something else also. Can mean the report because the drafting committee has produced a report. So I think being more precise, and there is a matching now between the meaning displayed by effort and the meaning displayed by taqrir. So I can translate it, I can go as far as translating it uh, or render it in the following manner. وَأَشَادَتْ اللَّجْنَ التَّنْفِذِيَّةِ بِالتَّقْرِيرِ الَّذِي أَعَدَّتْهُ اللَّجْنَ أو لجنة السياغة. Now, or sometimes when I say uh, Transparency International, I have to make it very visible. This is explicitation. And I think it's a mistake just to say This is not an Arabic style. Because in English, we can express this with capitalization. We know it is an organization, but in Arabic, we don't have that form of punctuation, which is capitalization. So, complementarity of meaning is a phenomenon, as I said, of everyday discourse that plays a key pragmatic function. Uh, so, I'm going to go and give you examples, more examples, and they will f finish my talk. And I would like to welcome your, uh, your uh, questions and uh, comments. Um, like the word, for example, al umra If you translate it umra by, uh, uh, with, uh, as a loan word, then most of the English speakers will not uh, understand what is this meant. So I think you need to go uh, to some explanation like the minor Hajj pilgrimage. 
and so on. Uh, and there is another example, a sai. Uh, it is the sacred rapid walking seven times back and forth between the hills of Safa and Marwa in a reenactment re of Hagar's frantic search for water uh, uh, before the Zamzam well was revealed. Now, now, when I pronounce the lexical item Sa'i for a Muslim and an Arab, immediately he will recall all of this. But when you say Sa'i or you translated the walking like that, I think you will miss a great deal of the meaning. Now, um, I go on to like uh, the word dove, for example, it is used here to mean hal uh, silmi. I can translate uh, dove hal. So dove, uh, for example, uh, another critical advisor uh, is revealed to have been the leading dove, who uh, hamama, despite the fact that the metaphor can work in Arabic also, but Munasir uh, al silmi When you say trade approach, uh, it's not the prototypical equivalent tijara uh, and, and so on. Now I have another example bus and ferry uh, and rail services were suspended. If we translate it in Arabic, and we have to make it explicit here, Sulutat. Uh, خدمات الحافلات وعبارات والقطار. I think we need something else. خدمات النقل because they collocate together. And here we translate with that matching uh, at some at some point. Uh, other examples. I'm going to. Uh, this is the, this is the last text I'm going to work on. Allow me to find the slide, please. Okay, now I will read to you paragraph in English and then paragraph in Arabic. What refugees face on the world's deadliest migration route? Investigative story. Turjimat B. What refugees face on the world's uh, deadliest? So, what refugees face, I would like to comment on that, and deadliest migration route. Tarjamna هذا النص في الفصل and we have made the matching work, not at word level, and I took my students to, and invited them, them sorry, to uh, uh, get a step further in making the matching in meaning. So what refugees face Turjimat Ayu Ahwalin Tatarabbas. So face Turjimat Tatarabbas. Bilajina Ladina Yaburuna Akhtar deadliest it's from dead but Akhtar Huna Tariq Hijra fi al Alam Stinging salty waves crushed over the deck uh, and by the way, this article was taken from the New York Times. Stinging, salty waves crushed over the deck as frantic figures climbed on board. It was midnight in November and we were 30 miles off the coast of Libya where our small ship was quickly filling with scores of terrified freezing refugees whom we had rescued from the chilly waters. I stepped over an elderly uh, man sprawled on the deck so I could wrap blankets around a teenage Egyptian boy battling uh, hypothermia. His eyes rolled back in his head as he tried to stay awake, etc. So it is translated in the following manner. 
تسلقت تلك الوجوه الشاخصة فرانتيك قاربنا والأمواج القارسة ستينجينج بملحها الأجاج ترتطم بسطحه وكانت الساعة وقتئذ منتصف الليل من أحد أيام تشرين الثاني نوفمبر وكنا على مسافة ثلاثين ميلا من السواحل الليبية وسرعان ما عجة في لينجويذ عجة قاربنا الصغير بعشرات اللاجئين الذين أصابهم الهلع وشدائد الصقيع فريزينج شدائد فيها معنى الشدة ميد اكسبليسيت وأصابتهم يد النجاة من المياه الباردة أصابهم وأصابتهم وي ار رايتينج إن أنذر لانجويج وأصابتهم يد النجاة من المياه الباردة تخطيت جسد عجوز ملقى على ظهر القارب القارب عفوا لشلل نصفي أصابه كي أتمكن من لف بطانية حول جسم صبي في عمر المراهقة يصارع الموتى لانخفاض لخفاض حاد في حرارة جسمه خانته عيناه واندحرتا رولد باك You will not find in any dictionary roll back in the hara, in the harata, il al wara. So this is a matching at meaning level. This we can accept it in Arabic in the harata, wa hi fiha ma'na al hazima, hazima al jasad li hawli ma ra'a. So I come to the conclusion now, ladies and gentlemen, and I am sorry for my lengthy talk. I would like to say that lexical items are malleable to accept novel meanings and usages more than we usually think. And that complementarity is ubiquitous in language, in translation. And proper matching, and perhaps also proper uh, clashing, is another level of professionalism. Complementarity and its investigation has or have both a considerable potential for illuminating human cognition. In order to study language, in order to study translation, we cannot avoid imposing our own limitations, our own interpretations, our own choices of how to read and interpret language. And thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention. Over to you, thank you. Dr. Ali. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hamouda, for uh, this interesting topic. Now I will ask uh, colleagues if they have any question, any comment, they can use the raise hand technique or they can write in the chatting section. Any question, please, any comment? I have a question, uh, Dr. Hamouda, if you yes, don't mind. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, while, while waiting for them. I think Actually, uh, I, I can see a, a, a hand. Somebody, yeah, please. I can, yes, by yeah, please uh, help me. Professor Maalij. Yeah, Faisal, I think. Yes. Dr. Faisal Maalij, yes, please, go ahead. Yes. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, thank you very much indeed. So I'd like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from Saudi Arabia, of, I'm, I'm Chesim, but I'm... Uh, in, in Riyadh now, uh, I, I just uh, I'm happy to, to be among uh, your audience today for this interesting talk. Um, I have a couple of questions, uh, uh, questions and comments. Uh, my first question is about the uh, the degree of applicability of uh, uh, of what we have said, especially complementarity versus contrastivity. Um, to translation, written translation and interpreting, because you, I feel a bit confused. <laughs> Sometimes uh, your examples in the at the end of the of the talk uh, sound a little bit more. Um, I mean, uh, they lend themselves to, to to translation analysis rather than interpreting. Uh, you, you, you kept using white. So this is one question. Then uh, another point is uh, 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 how could you manage, it's a question actually, how could you manage the, 
explanatory input you have used in the, the translation of the Sai. If you are talking in an interpreting context, it's interpretation because there is a real time management, there's a restriction in terms of time span. How could you do that? Parenthetic explanation about a Sai being Safari Marwa. Otherwise, if it is interpreting, how could you, how could you keep up with the speaker's um, fast uh, rhythm uh, without actually adding this input and uh, remaining at the same time uh, compensable? The last Thank question, you. maybe, <laughs> yes. The last yeah, question, go ahead. The last the point is about. Uh, you, you have used words like uh, cognition, cognitive, malleabil uh, malleability of meaning, and meaning flexibility. In fact, I expected some probably interface between your, uh, your complementarity and contrastivity uh, thesis on the one hand. And uh, for example, uh, André Gilles uh, efforts model, for example, which seems to be very close to what you are saying. Uh, of course, what you are saying, uh, I mean, Gilles' model is more formalized, but I expected some, some, some sort of uh, uh, probably interface or uh, maybe uh, referring actually to this, uh, to this model. I think we're much in this, so I really, this amount of uh, uh, comments uh, reflects my interest in your talk and uh, my, I'm really impressed by the quality of this scientific contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Faisal. Thank you very much. Yes, please. So uh, I don't know whether you'd like to take them one by one or to no, take them in rounds. Better, I think. No, better. Please okay. try to address these questions and then we move on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I first of all would like to uh, f uh, warmly thank uh, Professor Maalish for attending this this talk. I really feel humbled by his his presence, and uh, your your questions are really of a good quality, and this shows that you have really followed uh, the 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 talk uh, very attentively, and uh, you really uh, uh, captured the um, various meanings I wanted to share this this evening to my audience. So you have asked three questions. Uh, the, the first question on the degree of applicability of this um, complementarity versus contrastivity model, uh, especially in, in, in interpreting and, and the explanation, and uh, how to translate Sa'i Baina Safa wal Mara and without explanation or annotation in a way uh, in uh, Real time interpreting whether you don't, what you, have, you are struggling with time. And the third is about cognition and uh, Andre Gilles and so on. Uh, being an interpreter, you have to rely, that's why I included uh, a section on the mental lexicon. So the mental lexicon, when a word is uttered by a, a speak or a lexical uh, uh, item, then immediately you will look for its position in your memory and what possible meanings this word can denote. And of course, this is real, real, real time uh, interpreting and you uh, almost immediately, because the uh, interpreting this is another element in interpreting uh, which is um, favorable to the interpreter, is that you are uh, working in the hub and in the environment and the space with, where everything is taking place uh, very close to you. You can see and watch the context. You can live and experience the context. Like when you are have a speaker, you, you, you can see even in his facial expressions what is going on. And whether he meant by that word, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, this is, when, he, when somebody says, this is really hard, he doesn't mean hard. He might mean something else uh, in that particular context and you have to interpret it. So... 
I think it is the power of interpretation. And interpretation in interpreting is easier sometimes because you have access to more cues from the context, from the context about the participants, uh, the uh, what is going on over there. So I think you really develop the matching. And this is the work of the interpreter, is that uh, the interpreter uh, always thinks fast and consequently the matching uh, and the, or the clashing excluding some meaning it can't be the case is also immediate and also with experience with experience when for example somebody starts a, sp a speech like uh, in Arabic for example Ashab uh, al-Ma'ali, Ashab al-Sa'ada, Ashab, etc. So there is some time you can save here, your excellencies. Sometimes this is, stylistically speaking, this is more acceptable in English. They don't have that very sophisticated culture of titles and honorary titles, I mean. So perhaps this is an answer to the second question. If you have time, of course, because interpreting is the art of the possible and you are constrained by time, sometimes you can go quick and the availability of vocabulary, availability of the... because, in fact, there are three memories in, in the mind of the interpreter. You have the very immediate memory or the instant memory, the short memory and the long memory. You have the... Uh, uh, you, you will be making the uh, vocabulary, the words and the meanings available to the instant use or the immediate use. Then, or you write them, because you might expect that there will, if it is a conference uh, organized by uh, the former um, Dawa, Muradamat uh, Dawa, so you will expect a, a religious jargon and if you're speaking about al-hajj, uh, then you might expect word sa'i. So very quickly you can uh, uh, explain and with the time you have saved somewhere else. And you still manage your time. And it depends also on the stress and the cognitive load that uh, you are uh, experiencing. So this Thank is you. the answer to the second question. And the cognition, yes, I totally agree with you. It is uh, uh, because here I... Uh, let's say, emancipated the, uh, uh, this approach uh, from uh, a strictly uh, formal fashion to accommodate uh, the, the freedom of pragmatics and uh, the usages. And thank you very much again for your you. uh, good questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Faisal. Thank you, Dr. Hamouda. We have a question uh, by Dr. Magda. Madhur, please. Yes, go ahead. Yes, Dr. Magda. Ha Hello, do you hear me? Hello? Yes, we hear you in a good way. Thank you. I am happy to be with all of you. Uh, I just have uh, one comment and one question, please. My comment yeah. is, I think... Uh, the, um, the terminology that we use in linguistics and in translation sometimes confuse the translators or the students or the professional translators um, because um, it's not sometimes clear. For example, interpretation, interpreting, uh, interpretation, for example. Um, interpretation is related not only to uh, translation or linguistics, or it, it's also related to literature, to criticism. And I don't, I'm not sure the amount or how, how can a person who is involved in the task of interpretation can achieve objectivity. Because uh, I, I can see a lot of subjectivity can be uh, included in the task of interpretation. Interpretation here, someone who's trying to understand. So it is a cognitive task. It, it depends on comprehension and the analysis. It's, it's a mental process. Um, um, so uh, using uh, different terminology can confuse us because we need to, to make sure, um, for example, equivalence. 
uh, why we are using equivalence and some other people uh, refer to uh, equivalence to interpretation, for example. So here we need really to be careful uh, when we use the terminology. Uh, uh, regarding, my question is regarding the um, generative part of the lexical uh, items. Uh, now, uh, we have a problem here with acronyms. Now, what I can see from what you presented, sir, is that you, you don't give us, although you have uh, give us, given us uh, many examples, many words, individual words, but you rely on texts. It's impossible to give the meaning of any word without relating it to a certain text. And this is problematic when it comes to literary text. Now, it occurred to me now, for example, in The Old Man and the, sea, and the Sea by Hemingway. He has a very, very unique style because he uses the, the, the syntactic structure to convey the meaning of the word. For example, I do remember one of the sentence in his novel. He was an old man who fished alone in the skiff in the Gulf Stream. And he had gone 84 days now without it taking a fish. And he wrote Gulf Street, Stream, capital G, capital S. Capitalization here, in my opinion, plays a great part in the meaning because he wants to explain how he was in this big uh, sea uh, with, uh, facing all these challenges for 84 days without it catching a single fish. So, so the way also he puts sentences together, the relationship bet between coherence and cohesion plays a great part in conveying the meaning. So it's not only the lexical items in my, in my opinion, it is the text itself where these items are used. Um, my question is regarding the acronyms. For example, I was teaching um, a text for my students in consecutive interpretation or consecutive interpreting, to, to be correct. Um, we have this acronym, uh, CDC. And the acronym refers to Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Now, the, the word prevention is not uh, mentioned in the CDC, in the acronym itself. So, what happened that the students use the dictionary or they use Google Translate, whatever, and they used the, the literal translation for the acronym, Marakiz al-Saytara ala al-Amrad wal minha, which is not really accurate for this acronym because the, the, the Center for Disease and Control uh, in America huwa Marakiz al-Wukaya min al-Amrad. Well, maybe perhaps that's why they use CDC, but it is, it is known officially uh, as a full name, Center for Disease Control and Prevention. So now here thank the you. acronym is, is a problem. How can we solve this? So, uh, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Majda. Can you please, before answering Dr. Hamoudi, can you introduce yourself, Dr. Majda? Well, uh, I am Dr. Uh, al Mu'alis colleagues in uh, University uh, of Imam, Imam University in the College of Languages and Translation. And I teach uh, written translation and conference interpreting courses. I teach for BA, MA, and PhD. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Yes, please, yeah. Dr. Hamouda, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali. And thank you, Dr. Uh, Magda. Uh, really very pleased to e-meet you or to, I don't know, to create another word to Zoom meet you. I don't know. Perhaps we create one, we coin one new expression to Zoom, uh, to zoom you uh, in a meeting. Uh, uh, th thank you also for the quality of the questions and the observation, uh, the questions you asked and raised, and the observations you made. Uh, uh, it, really, yeah, it is. Uh, the, 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 there is a confusion of uh, terminology. I totally agree with you, but uh, there are some attempts to standardize those. Uh, technical terms related to linguistics, uh, translation and interpreting. Uh, I'm trying to use the most up-to-date terminology used by, used by uh, the uh, academic uh, world and also by the professional organizations such as 
uh, AIEC uh, and, and other um, translation organizations and uh, linguistics community. Uh, so interpreting is to be uh, uh, made different from interpretation. And I totally agree with you that interpretation is, um, I would call it, uh, meaning milking myself, interpretation. And when you author, it is meaning making. Uh, 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 Ta'wil, uh, uh, interpretation in the sense of ta'wil, is also in literature, in texts, even in dreams. Ta'wil al-ahlam. And uh, one of the, and we are uh, from uh, an, 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 a Muslim uh, culture, and you know that one of the prophets, one of the miracles is that he was capable of interpreting the dreams and incidents, who is Yusuf, alayhi salam, wa'allamnahu ta'wil al ahadith. Ta'wil al ahadith. So I totally agree with you that interpretation is an act exercised uh, in all disciplines. With regard to the terminology and ac uh, uh, yeah, acronym, acronyms, uh, yes, I, I totally agree with you because in Arabic we don't have acronyms. So we have to have a recourse to either the full name or sometimes I would say al uh, When, for example, I say the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, I can, uh, and they, they, they use later the uh, uh, acronym UNDP, I can translate or render it as al uh, uh, al or the fund, the International Monetary Fund, a sunduq But if there are two funds, in the text, I call Sunduq al Naqt and Sunduq Akhar. So, again, the, the, uh, my approach uh, is not designed by any means to reduce the, the, the subject and, or the interpretation or the equivalence in, 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 in the, uh, at the word level. So, it is not a reductionist. reductionist approach but rather it is one step and because uh, I, I, I didn't have much time to explain that this approach is basically designed for translation classrooms as one stage and definitely uh, this will not undermine the importance of uh, uh, other elements in the text, such as coherence, cohesion, uh, and 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 the, even the creative use usages of words. Uh, I'll give you the example in Arabic. And here, I would like to honor our colleague from Iraq, Al Basra, Ali Al Manna, Badr Shakir Al Sayyab, عندما غنى مش حتى غنى مطر 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 is something else. So these are the uh, connotations. Now, this approach is also to accommodate that matter can mean something else, and can the matching can be with some other item, not rain, for example, in English. I might suggest something else. So th it is an invitation for students to explain to think out of the box and to expand the scope of meaning, not to reduce it. So uh, it is an expansionist approach, uh, I, I, I would say. Uh, the acronyms also, like in Quran, if you go to Quran, you will have some, um, some roots, alif, lam, mim, and this is a meaning behind that um, so, thank you. so this is perhaps yeah. my answer yes to 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 the questions asked yeah. thank you thank you thank you uh, uh dr hamouda uh, uh, actually uh you mentioned uh, at the end of your lecture the word connotation the connotative meaning because i felt that you start talking about the connotative meaning and the connotative meaning we, when we talk about the the personal aspect 
And uh, as you know, and I think you agree with me, that the connotative meaning of any lexical item, any word, uh, is not agreed by people. But rather, it varies from one person to another, depending on their own personal knowledge, their own uh, experiences. Therefore, it is invitation, as you have already said, to encourage our students, please try to take into consideration the, uh, the overtones, the connotative meaning of the word, rather than you adhere to the denotative meaning, the dictionary meaning. So my question, if you allow me, uh, what you are trying to introduce, is it somehow uh, similar to what we call in semantics, frame semantics? Because as an approach, frame semantics also, we rely on our personal knowledge, our experiences, in order to figure out the contextual meaning rather than uh, focusing on the dictionary meaning, the, the, uh, the denotative meaning. And before answering that, also let me invite, you can take note, if we have time, you can answer. Otherwise, we have Ahmed uh, Mwannis, please. If you have any question, go ahead. Okay, good afternoon, Doctor. Uh, good afternoon, yeah. Uh, for, yes, first I'd like to thank you to this great value presentation, Doctor, which including many topics. Uh, this is Ahmed, PhD scholar in interpreting studies in conflict zone for Yemen. Actually, you grabbed my attention on such important point regard to mediation. Uh, as interpreter in the field, sure he will be alone, no dictionary to refer to, no already paper who refilled as interpreters in conflicts. Also, he demand to render the speech directly under pressure and sometimes uh, dangerous situation. My question is, what is the best way that interpreter could be used in such matter to rend the meaning currently and convey clear message? Uh, thank you. Doctor. Excuse me, Ahmed. Can you repeat the, the, the question or phrase it? Because there are interruptions uh, in your uh, audio input. And I, I understood generally what, what you mean, but can you uh, specify the question? Uh, I, I understood the conflict zone. Yeah, yeah. Zone yeah. Uh, doctor mentioned that that's uh, interpreter in mediation, okay? That yeah. interpreter yeah. should be used accurate meaning or some uh, common uh, terminologies. But uh, as you know, that's interpreter in, in such situation, uh, he would be alone. No dictionaries, no uh, terminology, no already papers he, he uh, already known. So what's the best way that interpreter should uh, deal with the situation when he demand to do interpretation uh, in such situation? Thank you. I got Thank it. you. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mana, do you, do you like me to answer now? Or you take... Yeah, uh, please. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, we don't have any. Yeah. We please. don't have. Okay. So, yeah. in, in reaction to your, to your question uh, and observation you made, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ali, for that. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, it started from a... Um, uh, let's say, a flame semantics as an approach, but... Uh, Meaning complementarity uh, is not strictly a semantic approach, as I said. So, uh, trying to frame something uh, to restrict it, but uh, meaning defies any act of restricting it or uh, framing it. Framing sometimes is dangerous because uh, as you said it, and here the example you mentioned, idiosyncratic uses of words, they cannot, they challenge any frame. These are personal uh, intentions. I would like to use that word for a purpose that I have. And I am a user of a language or a native speaker of that language, so I have the freedom and perhaps the power to use it. Okay. Especially in a part of the, I would like to give you an example in interpreting. Now, not only that, it's also sometimes a pronunciation. I remember I was interpreting for a guy from Nigeria, and he said, We in Africa we are facing multiple challenges. 
the fast one and fast I translated it as العاجلة نحن في إفريقيا نواجه العديد من التحديات والتحديات العاجلة الأولى التي نواجهها and then immediately he said and the second Ah, oh, I said no. He meant first, not fast. Luckily, there was no uh, major difference between first and fast in that uh, fast in that context. But uh, really, if the two words exhibit two different meanings, I will, would have been in trouble. And another uh, 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 incident. In mediation, there was a mediation conducted by a European country between uh, two states from the Middle East. And the mediator, he, he is Dutch. He was Dutch, sorry. And he kept on saying, well, I have an ID. I have an ID. So I was struggling with, I have an ID. Perhaps this is a secret language I could not have access to, or perhaps this is in the art or the uh, discipline of mediation that I don't know. But then, almost, he pronounced, I have an idea. I thought he, he meant idea. And in the Dutch language, when there is E and A, it is pronounced as E. So, interpreting, you are also having that problem of uh, pronunciation and accent. With the other question from Ahmed uh, from Yemen, and I thought that you are from the Maghreb Arab because you are writing Ahmed with E and not with the A, E, D, but then your accent is uh, really a Yemeni accent. So conflict zones and mediation and so on. Uh, I think it's not a problem of meaning only in the conflict zone. And they have worked in um, zones like camps, refugee camps, and some conflict zones. And uh, the problem is more than that. It's the agent of the interpreter as a mediator. How can the interpreter uh, act as a mediator and what is uh, what are the roles of a mediator is it only faithfulness to the meaning sometimes it is not because a mediator sometimes has to be a messenger of peace when there is a conflict sometimes trying to smooth the waters between the parties to the conflict and we have done that, and they have conducted a whole study on that. And the three parties, all of them in the interviews I have conducted, they uh, really favor that the interpreter goes the extra mile and acts as a messenger of peace by smoothing the waters, not translating everything. Uh, means the two parties to the conflict and the interpreters that they have uh, interviewed. And these thank are you, my questions to, to, to yeah, the questions thank you. Now let's move to the, uh, the uh, chat section. We have some comments. I will yes, start please. with uh, Dr. Jawad al -Ma'arij. Can you suggest Aynan Ghairatan instead of Indaharata? So you agree. And we have another comment from Rahma Hamami. Thank you, sir, for this help and information. I would like to ask you about how to deal with a contrastivity case when interpreting a speech. I mean, how, how do you deal with a situation where you are facing a phrase, the one you have already mentioned, the Good Friday, that actually translates to al al Hazina, which is the opposite of the original phrase, but you are not 100% sure of your accuracy. So how yeah can you answer that question? Thank you very much. The, yeah. Thank you. The the question about ghairatani or in the harata I would not I will rule out ghairatani for the simple reason is that they are going back in a, a state of defeat. Ghairatani might be a state already. 
So in the harata, there is the action and the movement backward. In dahara, wa dahar al adu. So uh, I would opt for in the harata because I know the context. Thank you. The second, you will come. The second question on contrastivity case. I can give you one case, one very good case. I was interpreting in a conference in the year 2011. And the conference was about creative writings for the revolution. There was a revolution, I think, in Tunisia back then. And uh, so many creative writers rushed from around the world to, especially those who are writing about revolution. And one Greek guy, he uh, was writing about the revolution of the Greek against the European Union and against Germany in particular, in the, especially after the years of the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, and so on. And he made, he performed, I would say, a very creative and poetic speech and said, we in Greece, we have two problems. And the, the, the title of the problem is one, the union. And he meant by the union, the European Union and the trade union. And he kept on using the word union. And you had, uh, the interpreter at that time had no clue about which union he was uh, 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 he was referring to. So here, even the context is not helpful. Is not helpful. So you have to use uh, uh, means, etc. Al Ittihad, Al Ittihad, Al Europi, or Al Naqabat, or Ittihad. The work we say in Tunis here, we are translating to Tunisians. So you keep both of them. Now. With regard to Good Friday, and uh, yes, so uh, this is language. You have to be uh, flexible to accommodate any novel meaning. So I'm not trying to say that this is good and it has to be translated uh, as hazina, but it is in a whole structure. It starts with individual words, with collocation, idiomatic expression, proverbs, and so on and so forth. But this is a reality. But this is one way of taking the students and novice translators and interpreters step by step. So trying to introduce that theory of meaning complementarity. Thank you. Thank you. The there, okay, yeah. uh, uh, sorry, can is you introduce a yourself, please? Of seconds for a final question. To conclude, I mean, uh, I have yeah, a please. Can I give it? Can Who's I talking? It? Dr. Faisal, I think? Yeah, Faisal, yeah. Yeah, yeah please, go ahead. Yes, yes Dr. Faisal. Uh, yeah. I, have, I mean, this is a, uh, uh, an impression I'd like to convey. Um, I, I've noticed this uh, amazing uh, profile, which combines the academic and the, and the professional. The, I'm talking about the professor uh, uh, Salhi's uh, profile, which I act, which I really find um, worth examining, um, which leads me to this question, Professor Salhi. Uh, uh, do you think that theorizing and modeling and interpreting uh, helps the professional interpreter and to what extent? Or on the other hand, do they actually um, make their prof professionals' lives uh, I mean, hard and complicated. I've noticed that you have uh, managed to find a middle ground between the professional side and the academic side. And you, you, I feel that you, uh, uh, you have a high degree of emancipation from strict dogmatic theorizing, which I really appreciate. I mean, my question is, that theory, uh, as it is now published about interpreting and translation help the professional translator and interpreter or not, and to what extent? Thank, thank you very you. much for this very good question indeed. Uh, well, thank you for uh, the uh, words, the very nice words you have said. I really appreciate that. 
Um, well, theory versus practice. Uh, I have four backgrounds. A common factor among them is translation. And uh, there is the, uh, let's say, the professional mind in me, the researcher mind, uh, and the teacher teacher's mind. So I'm acting with three, perhaps, minds. Uh, and uh, to tell you the truth, and allow me to answer this in Arabic, translation and interpreting, هي مثل أشبهها بالمعبد متعدد الأبواب الذي يدخل حرمه كل من يأتيه فلا يلفظ زواره أبدا إن كان الزائر باحثا لغويا ألسنيا أو صاحب صنعة أو غير ذلك. So it is accommodating everyone uh, there, and most of the interpreters are not researchers or people from the academia. They learned the skill. It is a skill by practice and a competency, I would say. So there are some people who started. Practice, practicing, uh, interpreting, and, and trans, trans, translating, I would say, not only translation, and then they wrote about it. The outcome of their experience. Now, I have invited, I have uh, scheduled, uh, 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 let's say, uh, have held a series of encounters. I've given them the name of Encounters at the Shores of Translation. Where, uh, in which I invited both practitioners, uh, professionals, translation interpreting, and also researchers and scholars. I can see students are more interested in the professional side. And some interpreters are not interested in theory, except few, those who are writing about interpreting, like uh, the, the concept of uh, effort developed by Professor Daniel Gilles, whom I invited. So most interpreters, they have little interest in that. And they know what to do by practice. So really, it is a, an interesting question. And I don't claim to have a good answer to it. I'm sorry to disappoint you, thank you. Professor uh, No, Thank you, Dr. Uh, Maha. Dr. Hamouda, yes, thank yes. you, Dr. Faisal, thank you all. Uh, if you allow me to comment on that, because when we talk about translation competence, the word competence, the denotative meaning of that word is wider than the word skill, because competence covers skills, knowledge, and also your personal, social, and or methodological ability to deal with things. When yes. we talk about translation competence, we talk about the most important one. You have already mentioned the linguistic competence. Here, when we talk about the linguistic competence, we talk about eight skills. Why eight? Because language A and language B. We have four skills here and four skills here, and it is the most important one. But in addition to that, back to the question raised by Dr. Faisal about the theories, the importance of theories, one of the sub competences of translation competence is your knowledge about what you are doing, which covers translation theories, uh, translation strategies, approaches, etc. But for me, I'm talking about myself, it is not as important as the first one, the linguistic competence. That's why we have a lot of people, a lot of people who can translate, who can interpret without any knowledge of translation theories. But it is good to have some knowledge of translation theories or approaches or, or strategies, et cetera. Uh, time is running out. Let me thank you all. And also let me, uh, just in, in one minute, uh, if you don't mind, just let me go to the, the uh, chatting section. We have some comments here from Dr. Hazm al -Dulaymi. Thank you, Dr. Ali al for Thank you, Dr. Hamouda Salihi. 
uh, for this invitation and thank you Dr. Hamouda for this interesting lecture. Our students sometimes encounter serious problems with cultural specific items. Yes, of course, uh, uh, this is another issue. And also we have uh, Abir Alawi, Abir Alawi, I think. Thank you for this. So, sorry, Alawi, this is uh, Iraqi last name. And yeah. we call it the equivalent in Tunisia is Alawi. <laughs> Alawi, okay. Yes. Alawi. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm seeking your help. Back to, to the point raised by you. When you talked about interpreting, you have the feedback. When you start talking about what the facial expressions. And also we have Abdel Qadir Nader. Uh, thank you there all for sharing. And we have, uh, hello, Han, uh, Hanna Abbas, uh, Cairo, from Cairo, Egypt. And we have a request from Ahmed, uh, Dr. Ahmed uh, Mwannis. Uh, if you can uh, send him your email, please. Uh, he wants to discuss something with you. Yes, please, he, I, I'm yeah, sure. Please, yeah. uh, I, I will help in this regard. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. That's it uh, for today. Thank you, Dr. Hamouda. Thank you, uh, our colleagues, for attending this webinar. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to end the meeting. Take care. Thank you very much and keep up the very good work. Bye. Thank you. Bye.